We know that uh, <coughs> some of you have to travel by public transport, either to their homes or to the hotels. We know that some others of you would like to watch a football match. Uh, some people in the audience are really starving. Uh, for example, Clarence. <laughs> <coughs> and some people have a nanny at home, so they need to be, uh, uh, they should leave within uh, half an hour or so, which goes for me. Um, nevertheless, um, I think it's uh, uh, well, part of all this that uh, there is a, at least a short question uh, or, and answer session after this, uh, this concert. So I would like to invite uh, a few people who will also ask uh, questions uh, on Tuesday during the official event. I will say something about that uh, at the end of this. Um, so, but perhaps uh, also this concert has raised some questions. So, perhaps, um, Nick, uh, I know that you were talking the last four days far too much. That's uh, more or less what you told me, but maybe you can make him talk as well. Why make Jesus sit in front of you? I mean, yeah, that's when you come from abroad. I mean, that's uh, our hospitality. <laughs> I have a very, uh, a very close and old relationship to the more intelligent position. I admire tremendously and, and am very involved myself in the idea of um, adapting open form scores for new performance and new technology. Yes, uh, well, the, the first thing is that, uh, yeah, I, I agree, it was, it could have been quieter. It is, uh, um, uh, my choice for, for tonight, at least, it is that for every piece that I presented, I try to uh, go against my best, uh, let's say, I didn't want to play them safe, but I wanted to expose or overemphasize those elements that were salient uh, or that could easily relate to what my position is on each one of the pieces in the thesis. So, uh, although the Feldman, uh, I normally do play it much quieter, I wanted to somehow draw attention, at least for myself as a performer, to what was the translation that I did uh, in terms of the interface from resonant objects where the um, edge of the inaudibility comes from the how soft you play. And what I presented here, which uh, where the, the uncertainty of whether a sound was going to be heard or not came from displacing the in the time domain the reaction of the pads that I was touching to my touch. So uh, there were some of so what I wanted to do was to follow the score, follow the instructions, and be surprised 
when things went against the, the, the actions that I was making. Um, the same way that a percussionist would be surprised that by trying to touch too softly, no sound is heard. Is that a, an answer? Are you satisfied? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Larry, <laughs> you have a question for us? Well, sure. Uh, I was trying to see one, right? Um, I'm tired. Tired? That was my question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll continue the old Americans talking about old Americans. Okay. <laughs> uh, and this is a question that comes from reading what you wrote about the cave in the Feldman, that there are what you call meetings of the cave. Mm -hmm. And I, the, the question I had was, given the nature of Fontanemark, less so King of Denmark, what's the difference between a reinterpretation and an interpretation? I mean, I uh -huh. didn't do that piece in, in Sweden myself. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lots of ways and lots of things to it. The story allows for almost any conceivable interpretation. Is your notion of reinterpretation specifically in that piece because you're reusing original materials that perhaps if we're doing the piece mm -hmm. in another way that we would enjoy doing? Um, I, I'm trying to leave these answers as short and to the point as possible. So okay. bear with me if something is missing. But um, uh, just in a nutshell, the three approaches towards interpretation or reviewing uh, existing pieces yeah. come from the prism of the computer music practitioner as a multi-threaded role that embodies a performer, composer, and instrument builder. Okay. So I do divide the, or I try to approach interpretation from the compositional viewpoint, the performer viewpoint, and the instrument builder. In the case of Feldman, it's more the composer. So what was the problem that the composer was, or what was the problematization that was presented in the piece that I could translate into electronic media? And in the case of Fontana Mix, I, my attempt was to go deep into the performer's world of the music and of, the comp and of Cage. So what is this Cage the composer? What is the relationship with David Tudor? How Tudor took pieces that were open-ended and made versions of them that remain fairly consistent uh, over time. So my idea was I want to approach interpretations towards connecting to both Tudor and Cage. And that's why I wanted to be able to build something uh, in, a perf in the performance moment that had a certain level of consistency. Yeah. Can I just ask a quick follow-up? Yeah. Is your notion of reinterpretation then, especially in King of Denmark, include a kind of recomposition? Uh, to a certain extent, yes. In the sense of King of Denmark, because it's from the composer's perspective, I, I said, well, is this silence, the uninvited silence or, and the welcome silence that comes from playing almost too soft? and how I can translate that to highlight something of the computer media, which is the disassociation between physical action and sonic manifestation. Mm -hmm. So the time displacement of the actions. I'm, I'm sad. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go on. Uh, Simon. Thank you, Juan. Oh. And I want to say thank you to the performing musicians. It's great to have something live. Um, Jeff, you mentioned that you were going to talk about something sideways to the PhD document and to the internet version of it. This is 2014, and most of the ways we are listening to music we know is through channels. And my question is about space, uh, space and place. Mm -hmm. And I've heard two kinds of space tonight. There were many, actually, there were different spaces in between. But two families of spaces. One, discrete, separate, deliberately, separated from the instrumental source, and the other more integrated that goes between. So space, slightly Newtonian thing, probably does not exist, but we carry it around in our imagination. I'd like to know more about your concepts of space, but also place, the idea right now, how do you deal with this space? 
Yeah, well, uh, my ideal situation would have been to invite people in groups of eight, put them in the middle, and, and have a super controlled sense of, of performa performance of the space. Because my notion of the space, especially what I am today, has to do with presenting the transformation of the physical space over time as my musical parameter. That is what I play. That is my sound, uh, which in a way uh, is, uh, is not necessarily something that has to do with dependence uh, or, or interdependence from having a, a life source, but it's this idea of applying actions to transforming the initial settings that a musician, let's say, for example, in the, in the last piece, um, everyone knows more or less what their material is and what are the consequences over time in terms of the kind of sounds that are, that are being produced. But my role is to keep changing the point of departure, the point of destination, and where the things are going to appear and disappear. Uh, so there's, although there's a sense of unity and there's a sense of continuity and consistency, there's also a sense of surprise for the performers. And, um, so that is, that is basically the, my, my present situation towards the notion of space. Now, in terms of place, uh, one of the things that I tried to create today was to, to also deal with the limitations of the real world. I mean, the time that I had today, the help, the assistance that I had today is far removed from what in the real world uh, uh, is, is available for a gigging musician that wants to play a piece. I mean, we all have experienced the, the pain of, of working for a year to present something that has this level of, of uh, fragility and then have to make the MP3 version available because that's all you can afford in 15 minutes of sound check. So I wanted to, to force myself to share with you the opportunity to present the music as close as it could ideally be performed. I, I don't want to say that this is the only way I would like to perform music, but if I can get away with it, I, I don't need to have 150 concerts a year, 10 are enough sometimes. <laughs> Ah, okay. Yeah, well, it, there's, there are two flavors that I'm trying to, to deal with. One of them has to do with this idea, wh what I said before, the, the, the moving the space so the other, the one who's generating the sound gets surprised of themselves. That is one, and is probably the, the one, the, the closest in terms of aesthetics to the work of Luigi Nono and, 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 and the things that I've been trying to work in connection with reappropriating certain elements of the music of Nono that I find um, challenging and beautiful and, and try to apply them to my own compositions. The other one, the one about displacement, the dislocation between the sources and, and um, the instrument and the sounds that you hear is my attempt to bring uh, into the world of electronic music or computer music two things. One is to bring notions of studio techniques that are historical and that we all know, like music concrete or electronic music, uh, as, as two big uh, me, uh, electronic music schools, and try to implement those things live. And things get rough sometimes. And the other thing is, in order to do that, I consider that it was very important to try to bring the traditional instrumentalists towards this world. So, be their generators of concrete objects that get manipulated. And in order, in, for them to feel that, the, um, that their contribution is as musically valuable as a traditional score, I think that I needed to emphasize this displacement. That they're doing something and something else is being created, but it's themselves in a distorted mirror. Okay, I think there's time for one final question. Uh, Clarence, um, you have one. How do you relate between Nono and the texture of the piece Mortal Kombat? Nono and the texture. Yes, it's dedicated to Nono. Yes. So what is the need there? There are two elements. One I already mentioned, the, the, uh, the, uh, 
it, it came from the work, uh, actually, I never publicly or privately thank Case for giving me the opportunity to, to go to BAMP in 2009. I think I was replacing you. And it was a revealing experience. I, I had the opportunity, thanks to Case, to, to be part of a project that was purely technical at the beginning, it was to, to reconstruct the, the electronic system for a Pierre and post preludium perdono. And after that, uh, after that work, I I got to perform those pieces over and over, but at the same time, I got to ask myself what were the elements that I could appropriate as an interpreter. So, I mean, these pieces are fairly static, and the work of the technician is, it has a certain uh, staticism that, that I, didn't, I didn't think that was uh, not challenging, but I wanted to find the connection with the original scores. And in doing that process, trying to draw information from the scores for the, for, for, for the traditional instruments and apply them to the electronics, I found two elements. One of them has to do with the challenging of, of what I call the performative unit, which is the relationship between a, an instrumentalist and their instrument. And the challenge comes from um, asking to the performers to, to play on, on an extreme range and against the natural uh, dynamics of that range. So to create these sounds that are on the, on the verge of, of audibility, on the verge of being able to be produced. And, and that's a way of creating confusion. And that is that notion of, of challenging the relationship of the instrumentalist with their, the other half is one of the connections that I wanted to implement in multiple paths. The other one has to do with the notion of transforming the physical space, which is something that I already talked about before. Okay, <clears throat> I think it's time to end the Q&A session here, also to give you some rest. Um, as I told you in the beginning, this is the, uh, the first out of three events which together form um, PhD defense of, of Kuan. Tomorrow, uh, December 1 at 1.30 in the same theater here, um, Juan will give a lecture uh, about... Oh, Farez as well, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, actually, I meant the same building. Yeah. Um, he will give a lecture uh, about his uh, thesis and uh, in connection to the music uh, that was played uh, tonight. And uh, one of the good things uh, actually, there are two good things. One is that uh, you get actually two lectures for the price of one tomorrow, because uh, <laughs> almost at the same time there will be a lecture by another um, PhD candidate of, of, uh, of us, and that is uh, Anil Kamchi, if I pronounce his name correctly, also on um, electronic... Sorry? Kamchi. Um, okay, sorry. Anil. Uh, Anil, yeah. <laughs> um, so he will give a lecture uh, also, I mean, uh, well, in back collaboration with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the second good news is if you didn't understand anything of the lecture uh, tomorrow in the afternoon, then uh, there will be another one, uh, so more or less the same, uh, uh, at 8 tomorrow evening at Stein in, in Amsterdam. Uh, and also for the people, of course, who can't make it tomorrow in the afternoon, you can go to Amsterdam and then still hear what Kuan has to say. Um, the most official part of the whole defense will of course take place on December 2nd, that's on Tuesday, um, in Leiden, in the Akademiegebouw. It's a 10 minute walk from Leiden Central Station. There, uh, Kuan will be in interrogated for some 45 minutes by an obscure committee uh, consisting of most of the people who already posed some questions today but then dressed in hat and gowns. <laughs> uh, and if that's not already worth going, then it's for sure worth going because then you will see for the first time in your life him wearing a suit. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it will probably be the only time that yeah. you'll see it. <laughs> um, the defense starts at 4.15 sharp, which means that the doors close at 4.15 sharp. So it would be good for you, and I hope you will all attend, 
to be there at least at 4 p.m. So thanks for coming here. Uh, I want to like to end with big applause for all the performers today and of course especially for him. Thank you.